Welcome to the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, celebrating 55 years of ministry. This week, Andrew brings you a portion of the 2023 Orlando Gospel Truth Conference. Brothers and sisters, I'm saying to you that God wants you to rise up and just decide that, praise God, I am going to find God's purpose for my life and I am going to go for it. And now, here's Andrew. So let's turn over to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 2 and let me just explain if you aren't familiar with this that the whole book of Deuteronomy is written by Moses recapping what they've been through in 40 years in the wilderness. And he is rehearsing this. It doesn't say exactly what period of time this is, but this could be written in one day or maybe two or three days, probably not more than a week. He is just rehearsing what has happened to the entire nation. And he's giving them warnings and telling them what they should do. And then over in the 34th chapter, 32nd through the 34th chapter is where he wrote a song at the end of his life, taught it to them. And then in the 34th chapter is when Moses died and God took him. And so this is just really one day or two days worth of him speaking and he's rehearsing things. And boy, it's really... Uh, powerful to see it all condensed and in hindsight. You know, lots of times in hindsight, you, you see things better than you do when you're going through it. So he's going back and rehearsing what happened. And there's some great lessons to learn here. So here he is talking uh, to the children of Israel and giving them instructions about what to do a- after he dies and how they should go in and possess the land. And so let's go down to Deuteronomy chapter 2 and in verse 24. He says, rise ye up, take your journey and pass over the river Arnon. Behold, I have given into thy hand Sihon the Amorite, king of Heshbon and his land, begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. And out of this, the Lord gave me seven things. I was just thinking about this and this is powerful. And so I'm praying that you would open up your heart and that you get the same benefit out of this. The very first thing he told him to do was to rise up. That's really important. The second thing, take your journey. That's really important. And pass over the river Arnon. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is behold. That's really important. I'm going to be talking about imagination there. And then he says, I have given into thy hand Sihon the Amorite. Not I'm going to, but it was already done. I'm going to be talking about how you got to see that you've already got it in Christ. And then he said, begin to possess it. And this is something that most people don't understand. They are looking for just, you know, to cover from where they are to where God wants them to be all in one step or in one second or something like that. But the Christian life has growth in it. And there's a lot of people that fight against this and because of it, they're hurting themselves and stopping their own miracle They are just looking for something to happen instantly like that. And that is not how God moves. He can move that way, but that is the exception rather than the rule. And this is why so many people miss it. And then the last thing here, the seventh thing is you have to contend with him in battle. And most Christians are not willing to get involved in the fight. They're looking for the easiest way out and they're not standing and doing things. So I'm going to be talking about these seven things. And I tell you, this really blessed me. And I, like I said, wrote this whole little booklet on that. So first of all, he said, rise up. You've got to remember that the children of Israel, these people that he was speaking to, all of them, all of the men of war had died in the wilderness. This is after, this is 39 and 39 years, just under 40 years. And all of the men of war had died. So all of the people that he was speaking to, unless they were old women or unless they were children that were under the age of 20 when the spies came back and brought the evil report and they refused to go into the promised land, there's just very few people there that had seen what it was like before they lived in the wilderness. The rest of them were born in the wilderness. These people had never known anything but living in the wilderness. They had eating manna. And you know what? I've, I've learned this, that most people take the way that they are born, what they grow up with as being normal, as being, this is the way it's supposed to be. 
You know, I had a man one time that when Jamie and I were pastoring in Childress, Texas, it's a long story, but he and his wife had lived in a nudist colony for three and a half years, and they had a two-year-old girl, and we met them at a park and got them born again, and they came to church, and, and uh, it was a glorious salvation. Good things happened, but this guy was a pain and a half. He criticized everybody and sowed discord. And uh, he came to me one time, I'm leaving this place because there's nothing but strife in this church. <laughs> and I said, you know what? There is strife in this church and you're the source of it. <laughs> I said, we didn't have problems before you came. <laughs> and it was news to him. He just always thought it was everybody else that was the problem. And I began to tell him, I said, all you've done is just criticize and so strife. And to my surprise, this guy had a temper and I kind of expected him to get mad. But you know what? Instead, he just, he got tears in his eyes and he said, I don't know what it's like to be normal. And he shared that he was the first person in the history of California that was indicted by the grand jury three times before he was a teenager. And he lived in reformatories his whole life. And he's, he just, he says, if you were telling me to act healed when I feel sick, I could do it because I felt well before. But you're telling me to walk in love. I don't even know what love is. I don't know what normal is. And you know, it shocked me to think that somebody grew up like that. But brothers and sisters, there's, there's people right here that your normal is not a biblical normal. And even your religious normal is not a biblical normal. And we have grown up in a wilderness and we don't know what we're missing. Did you know these people, they had a cloud that shattered them during the day that kept the heat from you know, burning them up in the desert. So they had a cloud that basically gave them air conditioning in the day. And at night they had a fire that warmed them in the desert. Plus, they had manna every single day. Do you know that the people that Moses was speaking to had never, ever gone out and planted crops, had done things like that? They lived off manna for 40 years. They went out and just gathered manna. They had their food provided. All they had to do was just pick it up. And I can guarantee you over in the fifth chapter of the book of Joshua, it says that they went into the promised land. They crossed the Jordan River. And it says they ate of the old corn of the land, talking about in the promised land, and the manna ceased. I can just guarantee you, because I deal with a lot of people, that there was a lot of those Jews that said, man, I'm not going to start planting crops. I'm not going to go out and till the ground and move rocks and work and do all of this stuff. God has supernaturally supplied for me for 40 years, and they were going to live by miracles. They weren't going to sit there and work. I just know that that's the way it is. I've, I've dealt with a lot of people. And these people had been in the wilderness for 40 years. Most of them didn't know what they were missing. And the Lord was telling Moses, you've got to get these people to rise up. Did you know before you can see victory in your life, you've got to get sick and tired of things the way that they are and these people, I can guarantee you, many of them had adjusted to wilderness living and they just thought that this was natural. And Moses was telling them, you've got to rise up. You've got to get sick and tired. You've got to desire something different. And I'm saying this to you. This is one of the lessons to learn from this, that you know what? As long as you can stand things being the way they are, they'll stay that way. A holy dissatisfaction is one of the greatest things in your life. It's just like, you know, a mother bird or something, they will start taking all of the feathers and the padding out of a nest so that it starts prodding those chicks to get out and to do something. But if you make the nest too comfortable, they don't ever want to leave. And there's a lot of people that honestly, you have just adjusted. I'm not saying this to be critical, I'm trying to stir us up. But you know, most of us have grown up without seeing miracles. I had a guy come to me this week in Bible college and he says, man, I've heard you talk about it, but I've never seen a miracle. When am I going to see a miracle? And so I just asked him, I said, how long have you been really seeking God? And he says, well, a little less than a month. <laughs> and I said, give it some time, amen. I said, we, 
I showed him. I said, right here, we saw a little baby raised from the dead, right here on this spot. And I said, we've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I said, just give it a little bit of time. You'll see it. But man, that's a great attitude. He was wanting to see something. But you know, most people have adjusted. Again, I'm saying this in love, but there are many of you that you have ailments you have aches and pains. You've got some things that are hereditary. You've got some things that are seasonal and you've embraced it as just normal. You're over 40. They give you black balloons <laughs> and depends for your 40th birthday. And you make jokes about, and some of you have just accepted this. This is not the way God intended you to live. Did you know Moses, it says in uh, Deuteronomy 34, I believe it's verse seven, that he was 120 years old and his natural force was not abated nor his eyesight dim. And he lived under an inferior covenant. Second Corinthians chapter three talks about Moses specifically and how he had the glory of God on him so that his face even shone. But it says that we are looking without a veil over us and we are looking full in the face of God and we're changed from glory to glory. That doesn't mean that it's just gradual you improve. It means you're changed from the Old Testament glory which was inferior to the New Testament glory. What we have is better than what Moses had. If Moses could live to be 120 years old without his natural force abated, he climbed a mountain the day that he died. And it says his eyesight wasn't dim. Now see, as I begin to talk about this, there's some of you already upset with me because you're saying, you're condemning me. You're saying that I shouldn't be wearing glasses or I should be strong or I should be able to. I'm not condemning anybody, but I'm saying this is what's available to us. You know, uh, Carrie down here, she's training for a marathon. That's a 26.2 mile race. And did you know every one of us have the potential of running a marathon? but not today. <laughs> you have to train for it. And so if Carrie was to come up and start talking about running a marathon and doing things, there's somebody, well, she's condemning me because I don't, wait, nobody's condemning you. You can stay a couch potato if you want to. <laughs> nobody's condemning you. You can sit there and, and refuse to do anything. It's your choice, but you do have the potential Every one of us were made so that we could do something like that. It's just a matter, are you willing to put in the effort? Are you willing to train? Are you willing to deny yourself and get up early and do some things? When we say what is available to us, I'm not condemning anybody who's not living this way, but I am saying that you ought to raise your standard and go to believing for something more. The first step to walking in victory is to get sick and tired of being sick and tired and to quit settling for less. And so many people are shooting at nothing and hitting it every single time. There are many people that honestly, your vision is, it doesn't even need God to accomplish your vision. Most of you shoot for things that you could do on your own if people just don't hinder you and get out of your way and if nothing really bad happens. I tell you what, when God calls you, he's gonna call you to something that is bigger than you. I often tell our students, I said, if, if you can tell if what you're doing is God's vision or not because if it's God, it'll be absolutely impossible. He will call you to do something that is a weakness of yours. Like me, I was an introvert. I couldn't even look at a person in the face. I couldn't talk to a person if I didn't already know them. I couldn't look them in the face. I wouldn't even be able to talk. And God has me speaking to millions and billions of people. God will call you to do something that is beyond yourself so it will make you trust in Him. He doesn't call you to do what you're comfortable with. He will call you to do something that is uncomfortable. And yet the average person just looks at their assets their resources and think, what can I do? What do I have the money to do? What do I feel comfortable? And you just, you're like water. You take the easiest route. You go to the lowest level. I'm not saying this to criticize anybody, but I'm saying God made us for something more than what most of us have ever imagined. 
And the sad fact is we've lived in the wilderness for so long, for 40 years, we become accustomed to it. And most people are, you don't like everything that's going on, but you look around and everybody else is as miserable as you are. And, and they aren't having any more success than you are. And you just learn to adjust. Did you know a holy dissatisfaction is a really good thing? You know what I believe midlife crisis is? It hits somewhere around 40, and people, when you're real young, you just are goofing off. You're just thinking about fun, and you aren't really paying attention. And when you hit 40, you go to thinking, I'm at least halfway through this thing. What have I done with my life? Where am I going? And all of a sudden, you start evaluating and sizing things up, and it gets depressing because you have wasted half of your life. And they call it a midlife crisis and want to blame it on hormones or something. What it is, it's usually when reality begins to sink in and you recognize, what have I done with my life? And you begin to start being discouraged. Did you know, I think that that thought about, is this all there is to life? Yeah. Is this all there is? You just get up and go to work, come home, watch television, go to bed, get up and go to work. On Mondays, you sing about, sing about Blue Monday because you don't like your job. You're going just because you got to have a paycheck. On Friday, it's all TGIF. And you can't wait to get off. I tell you, if that's describing you, you're wasting your life. This is not a dress rehearsal. This is the real deal. If you don't wake up with some degree of excitement about God, thank you for what you've shown me and that you are excited and you're believing for things. If you don't have a goal or something in front of you that is still beyond you, if you've already obtained all of your goals and you're just wasting time, man, that's a miserable place to be. Most people's idea is to work and retire so you can do what you really want to do. I tell you, you're missing God. You're missing God if that's the way you're thinking. Billy Epperhart down here, our CEO, he, he became a millionaire through real estate and things like this. And so he retired early and his wife, Becky, came in and she said she's going to kill him if he didn't get up off that couch <laughs> because it was killing her and it was killing him. And he had all of this potential and doing nothing with it. And that's about the time that we called him and he came to work for us. And Everything in his life has worked up to this point and helping him accomplish the things that we're doing. But I tell you, you shouldn't be looking forward to a time where you goof off and do nothing. If that's the way that you're living, you're missing life. And this little thought about, is this all that life is? You rebuke that. But you know what? It could be God speaking to you, trying to stir you up and get you to rise up before you can ever see victory, before you will ever see the supernatural power of God manifest in your life. You've got to stir yourself up or you're going to sink to the bottom. And this is what's happened with most people is that they look around and most people are afraid to get out of the boat. Everybody wants a testimony about walking on the water. And what a great miracle that is. Every one of you would love to have a great testimony, but you know what? To walk on the water, you got to get out of the boat. And the boat's sinking. There's no reason to be so attached to it. <laughs> and in the 14th chapter of the book of Matthew, the boat was going down. The boat was full of water. These people were about to drown and they saw Jesus and Peter said, come. Or Jesus said, come. Peter said, if it's you, bid me come. And Jesus said, come. And you know what? Before he could walk on the water, he had to get out of the boat. Most people don't want to lose the security of the boat, but the boat's sinking. It's full of water. In case you hadn't noticed, did you know suicide is up like two or 300%? People are sick and tired of living. They just, they're miserable. And yet everybody wants to be the same as the people who are committing suicide, the people who can't figure out which restroom to go into, the people that don't know up from down. And we, we want to be like everybody else. Everybody else is miserable. 
I tell you what, this boat's going down unless Jesus intervenes, and I believe He is intervening through us. But you shouldn't... You shouldn't be so desirous to be like everybody else. Everybody else is not enjoying themselves. You know, I'm not a perfect example, but God has revealed himself to me. I'm seeing awesome things happen. I get so excited, I can hardly stand it. I am so blessed that times, honestly, it's hard for me to contain myself. When you are in the center of God's will, there is a supernatural satisfaction that doesn't come to those who are just playing it safe. On today's program, you saw a portion of Andrew's teaching, Seven Steps to Victory, from the 2023 Orlando Gospel Truth Conference. Receive all seven steps to victory when you get Andrew's booklet, Seven Steps to Victory, today. Andrew is offering his booklet, Seven Steps to Victory, as his free gift to you today. This booklet is limited to one free booklet per household. Contact us today to receive your free booklet. Andrew's complete teaching, Seven Steps to Victory, is also available as a CD or DVD album and as a USB recorded live at a ministry event. Each of these resources is available for a gift of any amount when you contact us. This entire series is also available for audio download absolutely free from our website. You can also order resources or receive prayer by calling our helpline at 719-635-1111. Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. I dare to say the majority of you are playing it too safe. God's got something more for you than what you're experiencing and you are just letting circumstances dictate and control you. You know, it's my experience and every single person I know who God is using in a supernatural way and seeing things happen. I'm not talking about just ministers, but I'm talking about people who are prospering in business or in any area. They're people that get out of the boat. They take risk. They are motivated that God made them for something special. They aren't just a placeholder. They aren't just occupying space. They want it when they die that somebody will miss them instead of say, praise God, I can take over what they had. <laughs> God made us, every one of you, to be something special. And there's so many scriptures I could spend a whole hour talking about how that God created you with the purpose. Jeremiah chapter 1, he told Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, before you came forth out of your mother's belly, I sanctified you and ordained you to be a prophet unto the nations. God doesn't look at you and when you're 20 or 30 years old, look at you and see what your talents are and think, oh, well, I could use this and I could use that. Did you know why you were still in your mother's womb? It says in Psalms 139 in the NIV, it says something about that all of my days were written in a book before one of them came to be. Did you know God had written in a book what every single day of your life was supposed to be? Now, He doesn't control you and make it come to pass. You got a total control. And I can say that most of us haven't seen God's will for our life come to pass. We're just taking the easiest path. We're taking the safest path so that we don't run any risk. We're so afraid of failure that we won't do anything. I'm talking about your neighbor, <laughs> not you. You can punch them and say, he's talking about you. You know, the Lord spoke to me January the 31st, 2002, and this is after I had been in the ministry for 34 years. I'd seen people raised from the dead. I'd seen blind eyes open. I was seeing good things happen. It's not like nothing had happened. And yet the Lord spoke to me from Psalm 78, 41 and said, 
that in their heart they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Talking about the Israelites who came out of the land of Egypt. And he said, you're limiting me by your small thinking. And this was after 34 years in the ministry. And God told me I was limiting him. And I tell you what, I began to start thinking bigger. And since then, it is phenomenal what God has done. I'm not the greatest example. I'm not the only example. But I can guarantee you there's more happening in my life than it ever would have happened if I hadn't have started believing God and stirring myself up. And it's the same thing for every one of you. There's not a person in here that has tapped God out. There's not a person in here that is doing so much that God is saying, Andrew, don't encourage him. Man, he's already so far out there. I'm not sure I can keep up with him. I'm not sure I can fulfill these dreams. There's not a single person in here that has challenged God. I think it was Billy or somebody I just heard recently saying that if somehow or another you could believe big enough to challenge God, he'd just get bigger. <laughs> Amen. You can't ever out out dream God. God is huge. And we're sitting here looking for basically nothing, just doing things that might take a little bit of help, but we don't want to challenge God. It might overwhelm him. It might tax him. You know, I'm dreaming big. We've got probably a billion dollars building program that we're entering into, at least half a billion dollars and every once in a while, my staff will be stressed when I'm talking about some of these things, but I can guarantee you God is not saying, hold it, Andrew. I was in a service one time and the guy was talking like this about you need to believe big and Jamie put her hand on my leg and says, sit down. <laughs> Sometimes I terrify people with the way I'm dreaming, but you know what? God wants, you can't out dream God. You need to go to believing for something big. Rise up and do something. Amen. Look over here in 2 Kings chapter 7 and let me share this with you. This is about four lepers that were sitting at the gate of Samaria and the Samaritans were completely surrounded by the Syrian troops and they were starving them out. And it said that an ass's head went for 80 pieces of silver and one fourth of a dung, a dove's dung went for, I think, four or five pieces of silver. Can you imagine paying silver pieces to get one fourth of somebody's excrement <laughs> or some animal's excrement? They were starving to death. And this is where people were eating their own children and stuff. It was a terrible situation. And look at this in 2 Kings chapter 7, and it says uh, in verse 3, And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Man, what a great statement. Let me just say this to you. How long are you going to sit here till you die? I think it was Albert Einstein that said it's a definition of insanity to do the same thing and expect different results. There are some of you that are praying that God will change your life, but you aren't doing anything different. It's insane to pray that God just somehow or another changes everything without you changing. Did you know change doesn't come from the outside, it comes from the inside. And again, I could spend a lot of time on this, but when the Lord spoke to me January the 31st, 2002 and told me that I was limiting him by my small thinking, did you know what? I didn't pray and say, all right, God, do something big. What I did was say, all right, I'm gonna start seeing things on the inside. I'm gonna take the limits off of God. I changed me. Change comes from the inside of you. It doesn't come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7 says, As he thinks in his heart, so is he. I'm going to say something that might terrify you, but sometimes I've got to terrify you before I edify you. <laughs> but your life is the way that you think it is. I'm not saying it's the way you wish it was. I'm not saying it's the way that you are praying that it is, but your life is going the direction of your thoughts. As you think in your heart, so are you. Do you know if you're sick, your thinking is sick. 
That doesn't mean that you're thinking, I want to be sick. But your thinking is sick. You have accepted. You are receiving it. You are limiting what God can do to what the doctor has to say or what this holistic treatment has to say. That limits God. God isn't limited to the medical profession. Man, when they say it's incurable, that doesn't mean anything to God. But if you think it does, you limit God. If you're poor, your thinking is poor. I meet people all the time who are praying for a miracle and yet you think poor. When you go to buy something, you buy the cheapest, sorriest thing that you can because that's who you see yourself as being. <laughs> you know, when the Lord told me I was limiting him by my small thinking, my media buyer, who he buys like $40 million of television time a year and stuff. So this guy's a multimillionaire and he thinks big. Anyway, he took me out to uh, play golf and we played at one of these fancy places where you had to have a caddy. And after it was over, the caddies were cleaning the clubs and they were waiting for a tip. And so I got my wallet out and all I had was a $20 bill. So I leaned over to Doug and I said, Doug, do you have change for a 20? <laughs> and Doug just looked at me and he says, I'll take care of it. And he went around and gave all four of the caddies $20 a piece. Made me feel about that big. I was gonna tip five bucks and I thought I was being generous. And so one time after that, I went to uh, Phoenix and I was praying with, playing with a group of pastors and one of them came over and says, hey, do you have change for a 20? And I said, I'll take care of it. And I went around and tipped everybody 20 bucks. But see, there's some of you that I guarantee you, you, in, you go out to eat and you think, all right, what's 10%, 20% or whatever, and boy, you won't give a penny above it and stuff, and you just think poor. I love you, you cheap wad. <laughs> but there's people that are just, we had one woman in our school who she was raised during the depression and she literally would take her uh, jelly jars and I mean, uh, scrape out every bit of thing and then put water in it and mix it so she could get the flavor. She kept the uh, bars of soap and when it got down to where you, know, you couldn't really use them anymore, she'd save them and when she got enough, she'd melt them and make one more bar of soap. <laughs> And this woman was so tight that she would drive all the way across town, spend $5 on gas to save th triple coupons and save 60 cents. She had spent $5 to save 60 cents. That's cheap. <laughs> I'm not against coupons. Jamie has saved coupons. And, you, and if it's convenient and stuff, I'm not saying that you waste money, but I'm saying there are some of you that are just cheap. You know, it now, like I was saying, it takes me $11,000 an hour just to pay my bills. And I look at things differently now. And if somebody wants me to do something for an hour, I think that this is going to cost me $11,000. Is this worth my effort? You think differently. I'm saying this in love, but there's some of you that you were just raised to think poor. You see yourself poor. You think poor. You dream small. You've been told that you can't do anything. You know, my mother was a school teacher. And so she had access to our records and th stuff that many people didn't have. And one day she was talking to my brother and my brother, his IQ is higher than Einstein's IQ. I think Einstein was 164 if I'm not mistaken and, and my brother is 169. So he's a genius. And so she was talking to him about what he scored on his test. And I said, so what was my score? <laughs> and she said, you were two points above an idiot. <laughs> and did you know right before she died, I said something about that. And she said, that's not true. And I said, you told me that when I was in the sixth grade. <laughs> and she said, I was just joking with you, but all my life I thought I was two points above an idiot. <laughs> There's some of you that you've been told something like you'll never amount to anything. You're an idiot. And you know what? It's painted a picture on the inside of you that you won't rise above it. You need to rise up. You need to get out of this mentality 
You, God's bringing you out of the wilderness and he's got a promised land for you. He's got all of these things, but you're gonna have to rise up. So this is a great question. How long are we gonna sit here until we die? How long are you gonna keep doing the same thing that's not working? He goes on to say, if we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. So what you need to do is look at your options. They were looking at their options. If we sit here, we're gonna die. If we go into the city, we're gonna die because they're all starving to death. So what's the other option? Go out to the Syrians and look at this. He said, and if we sit here, we die. Now, therefore, come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall, uh, we shall but die. I love that. Some people just fear death so much, they fear failure of any kind so much that they would rather be miserable than run the risk of failure. And again, I say that there are some of you that are dissatisfied with your job, you're dissatisfied with where you are, you know God has something more for you than what you've experienced, but you are just so afraid of failure that you would rather stay miserable than run a risk. And I'm telling you, you're gonna die, maybe not physically, but you're gonna die emotionally. You're gonna miss on, out on the blessings of God if with that kind of an attitude. There is a joy and a satisfaction that goes with being in the center of God's will that you will never experience unless you do something different. You know, there's a place in Charlotte, North Carolina. Matter of fact, we got the Jollies here someplace. Where are the Jollies? Here's the Jollies over here. They're going to get up tomorrow and share with you. I've gone to their church. I went there for 32 years in a row, but there was a partner of mine in Charlotte, North Carolina, that every time I went to his place, he would have me come speak to his people. He would tell them that the clock is running. He's going to pay them for the time that they're spending. And he told me to just talk as long as I want to. And I would minister to him and then I'd pray with him. And anyway, I came out one time after doing that and there was an oriental lady that was sitting at the uh, reception desk and she wasn't back there with the other employees. And so when I came out, I asked who she was and she told me and I said, how come you weren't back with the rest? And she says, I'm the new employee and they left me here to answer the phones. And then she said, who are you? And I told her my name and she says, what do you do? And I told her I'm a minister and boy, her eyes got big and she said, for who? And I said, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And this woman just exploded. And she said, you're the one. You're the one. And I said, I'm the one what? And she told me that the night before she was a Buddhist and she was going through her rituals and she just, in the middle of it, she said, there's got to be something more than this. See, a holy dissatisfaction. She knew that there was a God, but she wasn't content with just going through these rituals and she just stopped in the middle and she says, God, I know you're real, but who are you? And she said that this ball came in front of her of light and it was pulsing light. And she heard an audible voice saying, tomorrow I'm gonna send you a man who'll tell you who I am. And she says, you're the one. And I said, I am the one, amen. And I got to lead this woman to the Lord. She got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I went out and sat in my car and I bet you it was five minutes before I could start my car. And leave. I was just thinking, God, I was in the exact place that I was supposed to be. What an honor to know. And there was a satisfaction that comes with knowing that you are exactly where God wants you to be, that you can't get praying for it and begging for it and asking God to give you joy and peace. There's some of you, the reason that you don't have any joy and peace is because you aren't doing what God told you to do or you're limiting him. Like I was talking about, I was doing what God told me to do, but I was limiting him by my small thinking, thinking, God, how could you use somebody like me? And you've got to change. How long are you going to sit there till you die? And don't be afraid of dying. We're all going to die. Do you know a friend of mine Dave Hinton, he's, he ministers with me a lot and he's had circulation problems. He's a six foot seven giant 
And uh, anyway, he, they wanted to cut his leg off. They even put a, a marker around his leg, dotted line where they were gonna cut on his leg. And he told the doctor, I will not be defeated. And he just refused to do it. And this doctor was telling him, you've got to do this and you got to do this. And anyway, he just, he wasn't responding. And the doctor says, you aren't taking this serious. You are going to die. And Dave just looks right at him and says, so are you. <laughs> and the doctor just, he, he said, what do you mean? He says, we're all going to die. I'm ready to die. Are you ready to die? And he just went to witness to the guy. Amen. But you know what? Unless Jesus comes in our lifetime, we're all going to die. Why are we so afraid of death? We sing a song about when we all get to heaven, what a day that's going to be. And then the doctor tells you you're going there and you start crying. <laughs> What's wrong with us? It says over in Hebrews chapter two that Jesus came to deliver those who, all, who through all of their life were subject to vanity through fear of death. Man, you need to get over a fear of death and not just physical death, but a fear of failure. The biggest failure of all is to do nothing, to play it safe. I can promise you when you get to the end of your life, I read a book one time about millionaires and they interviewed them as they were dying. And the number one thing that these people who were very wealthy said was they played it too safe. Every one of them said, I wished I'd have taken more risks. They knew that they could have done more, but because of fear, they just refused to do it. When you get to the end of your life, nobody's going to be saying, man, I did too much. I believed too hard. I trusted God too much. Nobody's going to say that, but there lo there's a lot of people that are going to be saying, man, I wished I'd have gone for it. Praise God you're here tonight. You don't have to exit this way. You can change right now. You can begin to believe God for something. So they looked at the options. If we stay here, we're going to die. If we go into the city, we're for sure going to die. So what's our option? Go out to the Syrians. The worst they could do is kill us. They were going to die anyway. What's the worst thing that could happen to you if you started believing God? The worst thing that could happen is that you fail somehow or another, get embarrassed. But you know what? I, I think God looks at things differently than we do. God looks at us like his children and it's like a little kid trying to learn how to ride a bike. And when you start riding, if you fall off the bike, you as a parent don't say, you stupid kid, if you'd have done it the way I told you to do, you wouldn't have fallen. <laughs> That's not the way a parent is. You go up and you say, look, you went five feet, you did good, try it again. It's always encouraging. God doesn't mind you failing. Every one of us fail. I don't do everything right. And you can fill volumes of books with all the mistakes that I've made. And yet God just encourages me and keeps me going. You don't need to be afraid. I think that God looks at us and some of us maybe in the world standards might have failed, but you know what God's saying, that's my kid. They believed me, they tried. And I believe he is pleased with people who will at least get up and try. So they decided to go out and just reveal themselves to the Syrians because the worst thing that could happen was that they would die. And so in verse five, it says, and they rose up in the twilight. You know, that's significant too. In other words, this wasn't early in the morning. This was getting towards the end of the day. Some of you may be getting towards the end of your life. You may think, well, I'm too old. I wish I'd have heard this when I was young. Even if it's your twilight years, you ought to get up and go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. God made them hear this noise. We don't know what it was, but it could have been that they were hearing the angels of God and the host of God. But they thought that the uh, Samaritans had hired a mercenary uh, army to come against them and they just fled. They left their tents, they left their food, they left money, they left clothes, they left food cooking on the thing. So these guys who were starving to death took a chance, went out 
and all of a sudden they had more abundance than they had ever had in their life. They went from nearly starving to super abundance. They ate until they couldn't eat anymore. They went and got gold and silver and raiments and hid it until they couldn't even take anymore. And finally they said, you know what? We're wrong. We're just consuming this on ourselves. We ought to go back and tell the people in Samaria. And they went back and told them. They went and checked it out. And these lepers who had been rejected by the people in Samaria went from being zeros to heroes instantly because they said, how long are we going to sit here until we die? Brothers and sisters, I'm saying to you that God wants you to rise up and just decide that, praise God, I am going to find God's purpose for my life and I am going to go for it. And if I shoot at the stars and miss and hit the moon, that's more than what most people would do. I'm going to go for it. But you got to rise up. You got to get out of this wilderness mentality. And I tell you, this world is, is like gravity. It's just pulling everybody down, telling you that you can't, telling us that things won't work. Did you know we started the largest expansion in the history of our ministry during the quote unquote Great Recession, 2008 and 2009? And I mean, when everybody was cutting back there's probably 200 plus ministries that are in the Colorado Springs area and I know most of them and I only knew two people, two ministers who kept believing God. The rest actually started decreasing their budgets 15 to 25% anticipating problems because the stock market went down. And that's when the Lord told me to start building. And in nine years, we built $130 million worth of stuff debt-free above my normal expenses. At a time when everybody else was pulling back, we started expanding. See, the world is just constantly telling you you can't. They're predicting failure. God said he would supply your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. He's not limited to the U.S. economy. It doesn't matter what's going on in this economy. God will bless you. I don't care what's happening. Did you know during that recession, Jamie had inherited a little bit of money from her father's death? It wasn't a lot of money, but we invested it in the uh, stock market. Again, it was, it was a small amount, but... Uh, Long story short, during the time that the stocks went down 50%, we made 50% increase. I still don't know how that happened. <laughs> but it worked. It's according to your faith, not according to this economy. It's according to your faith. God said he chose the weak things of the world to confound the wise, the things that are nothing, things that are base, things that are despised, to bring to naught things that are. And the reason he said he did that, 1 Corinthians chapter um, 1, verse 29, I believe, is so that no flesh would glory in his presence. God did it so that he would get the credit. You know, I'm a hick from Texas. If I was God, I wouldn't have chosen me. But he did. I'm glad that he did. And I've responded. And you know what? God is doing miracles through me and through my life. And he gets the credit for it. Because my mother, right before she died in 99, she asked me to tell her about what was happening. And I was telling her about all of our offices worldwide and the people that were being changed. And she was one of our biggest partners. She was blessed. But then she looked at me and she goes, Andy, you know that's God. And I said, yes, ma'am, I know it's God. And then only as your mother could do. She says, you aren't smart enough to do this. <laughs> she can put you in your place. And I, I agree a hundred percent. I guarantee you, this is not my great ability that's doing it, but it is my availability. God's not looking for your ability. He's looking for your availability. He's not looking for a silver vessel. He's looking for a surrendered vessel. And I'm telling you, if you are willing to just open up and rise up and say, God, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I am not going to sit here until I die. I'm going to do something. I'm going to find out what your purpose, your will for my life is, and I'm going to do it. If you're willing to do that, I guarantee you to transform you. That's point number one. But you know, the next thing, number two, he says, rise up. The second thing is take your journey 
And this really goes along with the same thing, that God has called every one of you to something unique to you. Matter of fact, I won't take time, but if you go to, sec to the second chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 5, 9, and 19, there were three groups of people that he told Moses this same day. He says, don't you dare go into the Edomites, into the Amorites, and another right. I forgot which one that was. And he says, you do not have permission to go. I won't give you a shoe breadth of their land. Did you know if he would have applied these seven things that he told him right here and have tried to use it against the Edomites or the Amorites or the other ite, it wouldn't have worked because that wasn't their journey. That wasn't what he told them to do. He told them specifically to go against Sihon, king of the Amorites, and Og, king of Bashan. There were certain things that he ordained them to do, and you can't do what somebody else is doing. You've got to find out what God called you to do. You know, if Satan can't keep you from following God, you know what he'll do? He'll try and give you multiple visions and dilute you. If you have two visions, that's die vision. That's division, and it'll destroy you. If you want to destroy a person's vision, give him two. You need to find out what God called you to do. And you know, I have people ask me to do all kinds of things all of the time, but I know what God called me to do, and I have to stay on track with what God called me to do. I've got to be stirred up, but I can't just go out and do anything. Not everything that's good is God. Satan will get you sidetracked doing all kinds of things that may be good, but it's not God. You've got to have a specific understanding of what God called you to do. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is for everybody. This isn't just for preachers. This is for everybody. It's our reasonable service. And then verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And this says, You will prove, make manifest to the physical senses, what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And I spent from Christmas of 1967 till March the 23rd of 1968 doing nothing but praying Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and saying, God, what does it mean to be a living sacrifice? How do I become a living sacrifice? What does it mean to renew my mind? What does all, all this mean? And I just prayed. And then on March the 23rd, 1968, God showed up in a prayer meeting. And I tell you what, it transformed my life. And God revealed himself to me and showed me what he wanted me to do. Sometimes I start with that testimony about when the Lord changed my life. But I had been for a, a year and a half been studying the word. And for four months, I had been meditating Romans 12, 1 and 2. And there's a reason God revealed himself. It's because I saw it. You know, we often quote Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. It says... I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. The NIV says a hope in a future. And we often quote that verse, but then we forget the next two verses. In verse uh, 12, it says, Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you, and you shall uh, seek me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. People say, God... What's your will for my life? I've got three minutes before my favorite show comes on. Would you reveal yourself to me? That's not seeking God with your whole heart. As long as you can live without knowing God's purpose for your life, you will. He won't force himself upon you, but he has already written in his book what your life is supposed to be. Your talents, whether you're a male or female, you can't change that, by the way, for those of you that don't know that. Whether you were born male or female, whether what color your skin is, your talents, your abilities, everything about you was created by God to fulfill a purpose 
and you've only got one chance of finding what that purpose is. It's not up to you to pick and choose and do whatever you want to do and then ask God to bless it. You need to take your journey, the journey that God prepared for you, not for somebody else. You can't live another person's dream. You can't be like anybody else. You're better at being you than you are anybody else. You need to get comfortable in your skin in what God called you to do, 